An inferior product with superior messaging will always beat a superior product with inferior messaging. So if you can marry a superior product with superior messaging, nobody can compete with you. What that means is here's some practical methods. Um, jump, and I'll, we'll just talk tactically. You can now measure, you can segment your audience with the Facebook pixel on how much time they spent on your page. So the people that, the top 25% of people who spent the most time on your page, those are your buyers. Uh, time is so, dude, in this day, we get new information, millions of bits on the second. And so if they spend more than a few seconds on your page, there's high interest. Hello, and welcome to a, another episode of The Robust Marketer. Uh, today, I have a very special guest, uh, Trevor Chapman. So Trevor, I, I first became aware of him like, uh, you know, about six months ago when we were, we were starting to put it, putting together some of our events. And I, and I did a little digging on him. And, and it, like, the guy just, just is a, a growth specialist. You've just done so many interesting things. You've got zero to a million followers in 45 days. You, you, you get a, you, you built a top five podcast in five days. You have also, like e-commerce related, you've had a zero to eight figure exit within 12 months. You've had zero to one million within 90 days. Uh, and then somehow on top of all this, uh, MIT Tech Review has called you a global thought leader. Uh, so you're doing a lot of cool things in e-commerce. You've got a really sort of like inspirational brand going on. Uh, and I'm super happy to have you on the podcast today. How's it going? It's going great, man. Thank you. I appreciate, I appreciate that. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, I think I think one of the first things I saw from you was uh, was you know you produce these sort of like inspirational videos in a way about <laughs> about sort of like about overcoming limitations. It's funny. It's like it's a common theme among everyone who does e-commerce that I've met is like everyone is into personal growth and growth hacking. Everyone is sort of against you know personal stagnation in a way. Talk a little bit about your approach to to life in general. Well, so I'll talk about those videos for a sec. Um, you know, it's it's interesting. I uh, will hit like a state of flow. In fact, I have my flow shirt on right now. I can't pull it out, but basically it's my flow. It says flow and it has surrender and discipline. And, uh, I was walking around with my, with my video guys and they're like, Hey man, just, just free flow and just start chatting. And so I did, and, uh, they liked it. And, uh, so they said, Hey, look, um, we're just going to kind of stick you downstairs and just, just go off. And so I went off on, I don't know, probably 45 minutes about different topics and they took it and they cut a bunch of it together and then, um, you know, just started putting this information out there. <clears throat> it's one of those things where at the end of the day, I value just a couple of things uh, more than anything else, tranquility and peace of mind. Uh, I just, you can't put a, a value on those. If I don't have peace of mind, then whatever I'm doing is simply not worth it. And to lead a tranquil life is, is the, a life of, uh, fulfillment. It's a contemplative life. I studied philosophy in school and uh, I don't know, you know, I'm a product of my background as, as everybody is. And so these videos are just kind of more of a, uh, wellspring of what, what's inside of me. Some of them did really well, you know, some of them, no one watched. You know, there was there was no specific objective, but um, they reminded me of yeah, Jason. Man, that, so did you ever watch Jason De Silva videos? Did you ever watch those? It was like Joe Rogan used to have oh. Jason De Silva on, and he would talk about the universe and in the and really like just sort of the momentum and uh, their, their videos. Jason De like, Silva or Jason Silva? It's Jason Silva. It's Jason Silva. Dude, Jason Silva's the man. Yeah, I yeah. love his stuff, dude. So it's interesting because I'm chatting with him and uh, a couple of his partners right now about launching a CBD brand. And so, you know, he has a massive audience and it, it's one of those things where his audience is so niche that it would be perfect for that. So cool. yeah, it, it is. Jason Silva is kind of like an influencer to me, hundred percent. I can kind of tell from the, the tone and the momentum and everything. So uh, we jumped ahead here though. So usually we start with the marketer hero's journey uh, to tell us sort of how you got started, okay. how you got to where you are today, how you did, I guess, you know, we only have a short time. So start with just your, your journey and then we'll talk a little bit about some of these accolades and some of these, these cool. growth spurts that you've had. Yeah, man, let's do it. So I grew up in Guam. Um, my dad was a well or a scuba diving instructor in Guam, lived there till I was 12. All I wanted to do when I grew up was be his deckhand on the boat. 
Um, every day after school, I was out there. I was one of two white kids in the school. And so, you know, we grew up, uh, I think, differently than than most kids in Canada or America. When I was 12, though, we moved to Alaska. So I was neighbors with you on Sitka. You're on. You're in Vancouver, right? Yeah, I'm on the island. I'm on uh, Victoria. Awesome. Dude, okay, so I'm like 50 miles north of you then. Not right now, nice. but but so my dad was a whale watching boat captain up there. We grew up superbly poor. I actually didn't realize how poor we were until years later I could kind of analyze in retrospect. Um, and so I, I grew up with my parents valuing um, things other than money. And uh, while there, while I like kind of achieved 80% contentment with that, you know, I was also that kid that played every sport until it was time to pay for the jersey. And then when it came time to pay for the jersey, I had a great reason why not to. I ex I became an expert on the art of running without showing the bottom of your soul because my buddies' names from the previous year would be written on the bottom of their souls. <laughs> and so um, I, I was cool with it, but, uh, you know, I, I think that regardless, there, there's childhood things that, that spill over and a lot of the values that we gather and everything come come from our, our childhood. Long story short, uh, after high school, I lived in Europe for many years. I speak Russian, lived over there for five years. Uh, 21 years old, fall in love, and I have a buddy, and he's like, dude, this girl's dad's a millionaire. You better, you better start doing something. Come out and knock doors with me in California, sell some pest control. I did that for a summer to pay for school. And uh, I did so well, not because I was innately good at it, but because uh, these guys weren't used to, I think, the uh, kind of work ethic that I had grown up with. See, for and people who know me know this story. For those that don't, I'm sharing it with you for those that don't. But um, uh, three, four years ago, we were talking about at a family reunion, our least favorite chores growing up. People were like mowing the lawn, doing the dishes. My least favorite chore growing up was catching, gutting, and canning 36 salmon every day, my family's limit of salmon. Now that's illegal. So I had to do it before the sun came up so fishing game wouldn't catch me doing it. And then by uh, by 2 p.m. I'd ride my or I'd ride my bike down to the docks where all the tourists would line up, play my saxophone, you know, make money to pay the mortgage. And so for me, uh, work, hard work, uh, that wasn't, yeah, hustling, yeah. that wasn't something that was like optional. It wasn't like, how do I fill today? Well, tomorrow I'll just double my limit in salmon. I'll, I'll catch double. See, that that was there was no tomorrow. We just had right now. And so to take care of right now in the future, this had to be done. So that kind of spilled over uh, throughout the rest of my life. Uh, if the rest of the guys worked five hours, I worked 10. If they worked six, I worked 12. I just kind of had this personal philosophy that if I'm going to spend my time um, in anything, then I'm going to spend it at its maximum capability. So if I'm going to draw, for instance, then I'm going to draw a masterpiece. If I'm going to work, then I'm going to work harder than anybody else uh, and match my level of whatever the top level of work is for me, not just beating the guy behind me, but just fully immerse myself in the opportunity to achieve. Like I'm not going to, and it's just, so when I rest, I'm fully disconnected. When I read, I'm fully in the book. It's one of those things where I think too often, especially with this age that we live in, where we've got this immersive digital landscape, that constantly our minds are not focused on one sole objective. They're they're everywhere floating, you know, in the cloud with the rest of the information. And that creates a state where we accomplish so little in such a large amount of time. And, and creates so, a lot of anxiety as a byproduct. I 100%. Think, I think there's a, a massive amount of anxiety that comes from that, that style of living through scrolling through the news feed and... Uh, and things like that. So it sort of fits with your ability, to, your your idea. You're, it's in, really interesting to me that your main goals are peace of mind and tranquility. It's not something, and that's you know that's not something, especially you know when you oppose that with how hard you've hustled throughout your life. But it's but it's almost like because you've done that, you're able to achieve, uh, you know, that peace of mind because you know you've given the other aspects of your life their full due. Dude, peace of mind is one of those things. Like when I try to explain what it is, people are like I kind of get that. Let me tell you what it's not. And we're so far disconnected from school that maybe we forget this. But you know when you got in trouble at school and you knew the principal was going to call your parents and you're walking home and it's just that horrendous feeling knowing that that phone call is yeah. coming. And it sounds juvenile now, but we all experience that even in our adult lives, et cetera. And that's a feeling that I refuse to have in my life. And that can come... Yeah, well, that can come from so many different things, not just from outward authority, for, but inwardly especially. 
a lack of peace of mind and discontentment comes comes inwardly. And so anyway, well, I'll fast forward. You know, I build a pest control company. Uh, 2008 rolls around. I've had it for three years. We're in three states, California, Florida, um, Arizona. Uh, I think I'm the bomb. In fact, I think I'm so much the bomb that I'm preparing to buy a sailboat and sell down to Necker Island so I can just chill with Richard Branson. <laughs> unbeknownst to him, my friend. Unbeknownst to him. <laughs> nice. And... Um, uh, all of a sudden, the economy collapses. Practically over the night, I lose 40,000 customers. I've got 38 employees. Things are just going uh, miserable. Um, and I, uh, you know, I, I'm probably too egotistical to realize that it wasn't me at that point in time. And I think it's a good approach to business is to assume that everything that happens is a direct result of you. But I, um, because I refused to place any accountability on the economy and it was all me. I thought there was stuff really wrong with me. Um, I, you know, I remember one night, I, payroll was the next day or something, and it was just, I was consumed with this agony uh, that was the uh, the cause of, the source was stress from payroll and from, you know, paying commissions and everything like that. And uh, it manifested itself outwardly, like it was rolled up in the fetal position on the ground uh, because I couldn't deal with it. I didn't talk about it for years because I was like, dude, is this what? what's something weird? Like, what's wrong with me? And, uh, you know, it was around that point in time that I, I learned two lessons. I won't go deep on them, but I think they're worth sharing. The first one was that in an attempt to recover from 2008, I kept adding more things to my plate. I kept adding more items to my to do. I kept coming up with ideas. OK, and I need to do that. And I need to do that. And I need to do that. And the problem was I wasn't even getting to the other stuff that had to get done on my list. We like to make things more complex. Um, what I found is that anytime you want to make lasting change, you start with asking yourself, what will I no longer tolerate? I was tolerating way too much. I was willing to live in a state that I should have been unwilling to live in. And when I ch changed that frame of reference, it's not that something physically in my world changed. It's that the, the, the viewpoint that I stood, that all of the work was being accomplished from drastically changed. And in doing so, it allowed me to all of a sudden go from not even scraping by to jamming. Uh, so that was number one. The second thing was more strategic. I realized that I was in the accessory business, like an accessory are things that people don't need when times get tough. Uh, pest control is one of them. That's the first thing you cancel if you don't have money. And so I needed to somehow transition from accessory to necessity, uh, sticking with my core competency. See, one of the things I think that too many people do, me included, is we jump from thing to thing to thing to thing, and we never put in enough time, sufficient time, to master the art or master the craft of whatever it is we're focusing on. And so we're amateur in a bunch of disciplines and pro in none. My core competency was door-to-door -door sales. I could sell, I could recruit thousands of people to sell. I had recruited thousands of people, trained them, managed them. So I said, look, I'm gonna stick with this core competency. I'm not gonna jump into something new and start from scratch. I'm going to stay with what I am. I'm just gonna change the things that, that on the outside matter so much, accessory versus necessity, but that have no impact on the way in which we do it. So I transferred kind of the product line and I, I became a security company. By law, companies had to have fire monitoring. Um, fast forward a few years, and uh, now we're in California. Things are going great. And one of my neighbors was, I don't know if you remember, but when one of the first iPhones came out, this had, they had this thing called Newsstand. And it was a bunch of yep. you know print journals, but on in digital format. Well, my neighbor was the largest digital content producer back then like there wasn't a lot of digital content and we talk about it now and it's flooding us, but he produced 70% of all of the magazines in there. And he's like, Hey Trevor, do you guys do access control? And I'm like the security kind of access control. And he's like, yeah. And I said, we do man. And we, we are bomb. And he said, all right, bring me a, uh, bring me a bid tomorrow. I was like, we'll do Walked back to my office, sat down at my computer and I Googled what is access control. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's good. I don't know what it was. I found a company that um, I thought you know would do it well. I threw my T-shirts on them. I said, "You guys represent me. You work for me." They went in, made a bid. I raised it by ten grand, took it back the next day, sold it, and a year later, we were Access Control Integrator of the Year in LA County. We ended up doing all the access control for Amazon.com, for Boeing, for Mac Cosmetics, for all the subways. What is it? Uh, Control is when you swipe a card or a fingerprint or a retina scan to open up doors. So it's, you know, controlling access to a building. 
Gotcha. Um, and so for nothing, and so we we just dominated the area because we took took that same. It was kind of an old industry. Everyone else was had been doing it for 40, 50 years. And we just came in and we flooded it with this new energy, this vibe. Like again, if we're gonna focus on access control, why be mediocre? Let's dominate the arena, which is what we did. Um, you know, I got so deep in security that, and this is a tangent, I won't go into it, but I'm the only American uh, that partnered with the country of Israel to bring the Iron Dome into America. That's a software that shoots missiles out of the air. We brought it in to stop school shootings. It was a little too, dude, what's that movie with Tom uh, Cruise where they have those those chicks that lay down and like they can tell the future? Minority Report. Oh, yeah. 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 So it was a little too Minority Report at the time. Like we even got the local sheriff here over over uh, Salt Lake County. I'm in Utah right now. And we're going to make the first smart city and all this stuff. And it just kept being shut down because people don't like predictive analysis. Mm. Um, and so we sold that to the Blank family. They're the ones that started Home Depot. And this is about the time that I transitioned almost online. I got into solar. Again, my core competency was these aggressive guerrilla sales, right? Door-to-door -door sales. I saw solar as a temporary gold mine. People are putting these panels on their roofs. I can capture the market. We got so big that Goldman Sachs came in, put 40 mil into the parent company, and uh, things were going good. We're in multiple states, and I'm walking by my marketing department. This is 2016 now, and they're like, Trevor, we need more money. And I'm like, guys, look, you're spending money. You're not making money. Here's my philosophy in business. You either produce at the highest level, so you move the needle, revenue generating activities, or you support the highest producers at the highest level. If you're not doing one of those two things, then it's dead weight. And this is not a charity, those exist, uh, but this is not one of them. And so you are either a, higher produ a highest producer or you support the highest producers. And right now you guys are sucking because you're spending all this money not bringing anything in, what's going on? And they say to me, SEO, PPC, SEM, all these things that are kind of like this long tail version of getting stuff. And yeah, we'd spent a year on this by this point. I'm like, the time is up, my friends. I realized in that moment, I'm like, you guys are engaging in query-based marketing. Mm -hmm. Query-based marketing, search-based marketing, that's when the customer already knows that they want what you have. And now it's a matter of deciding who to go with. So if they were searching for solar, they would find Elon Musk. I can't compete with him. See, he spent $3 billion and made $1.5 billion in return. Every dollar he spent, he got a 50 cent return. For you and I, that means bankruptcy. Yeah. And for most small business owners. And so it's like if, if we want a toothbrush, we both go to Amazon, we type in toothbrush, buy the highest quality toothbrush at the lowest price. For marketers, we can't compete when we're fighting over pennies like that. In fact, sometimes we go under. So I said, how, how can we turn this? See, the key, our key was that we would bring the product to the customer. We'd knock on their door. We would indoctrinate them. We'd educate them so that by the time they were done, they knew they wanted our toothbrush and our toothbrush was $100, and it made sense why it was $100. Yeah. And so if someone else came and said, well, we have a similar toothbrush, and it's only 25 bucks, they'd be like, well, what's the catch? Like, 20, I'm not, ugh. Like, like, with all the knowledge they had, they knew why it was supposed to be $100, and a lower market leader would not even compete because they couldn't compete on the level of education that we had provided. And so I said, we've got to be able to do that online. How do we go screen to screen online? How we go door to door in the real world? Because when you engage in disruptive based marketing, then you can sell it any perceived value that you can effectively illustrate. So if I sell products, I know we're going to talk about this site soon, you'll see that almost all of those products people also sell on Amazon. But while they're not defensible, I sell them for 10, 20, five times more than anywhere on Amazon. And it's because the messaging I control from the very beginning to the very end. So many people have written me and been like, dude, I duplicated your site. Why am I not getting sales? And it's because First off, you have zero perceived value. Number two, the messaging starts long before they land on the landing page. And so if they land on a landing page and I'm selling something for 65 bucks and you're selling it for five bucks, they're not gonna buy what you have because they're gonna say, what's the catch? Why is this only five bucks? Long story short, I said, I'm gonna put this to the test and, and try out my, my theory. Um, threw a website up, started selling solar batteries um, and other solar products on it, broke a million bucks in 92 days and said, you know what? I am due for a change. I'm tired of door-to-door -door sales. And when we had uh, Goldman Sachs came in, the entire structure of everything changed. What made us awesome to begin with, this startup with a bunch of college buddies where we were nimble, we were quick. It turned into this long process of suits in the office, analyze it. By the time something was approved, we had already lost our advantage. And the only advantage we had, again, was time because we're fighting against guys like Elon Musk. Yeah. So it was ready for a change. So I exited that company and focused, kind of transferred all my focus full time over here. Um, and and what I did in doing so was just take that same 
um, philosophy, and I brought it online. Um, and so, you know, I've been up to ClickFunnels a whole bunch of time and talked with Russell and his whole team. He's had me talk to his whole team about certain things that forever were just accepted, like ugly landing pages convert better. To me, I'm like, dude, that makes absolutely zero sense. Now, maybe that's how you're perceiving it. Maybe that's on the outside what it is, but that's not what it is. So I started testing and I was like, it's, there's no way ugly landing pages convert better. But I, I started running all these tests and it found out that 68% of the internet bounces. They don't wait for the page to load. And yet, as marketers, you follow up with them as if it did load. So you're like, okay, fine, 15% off. They're like 15% off what? I don't even know what your original offer was. And so I said, I'm gonna take a step back and go back to the basics. It's not that ugly landing pages convert better, it's that beautiful landing pages take too long to load. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the customer never knows even what the offer is. So if I knock on your door and you don't answer, I don't go back and I knock on it again. I'm like, all right, 15% off, let's do it, coupon. They're like 15% off what? I take the approach of door-to-door -door sales online in its entirety. And so if I knock again and I know that they didn't answer, then I follow up with my original messaging. If I'm talking to them and they, like I am, into uh, like segmentation almost on the level of psychosis because I wanna know how much time they spent on the page, what pages they were on, what search terms did they use, and I segment them based on all of their behavior so that someone that is worried about the return policy only gets hit with return policy advertising. Not advertising about a new sale, not advertising about shipping times, not advertising about free shipping or 25% off. They don't care about any of that. They care only about the return policy. And so if I can segment them all and then especially segment that largest group of people that have no clue what the offer is in the first place and then remarket to them, not retarget, but remarket to them in a manner that is conducive with a buyer profile that, that matches their unique persona, then I'll beat anybody even if my price is 10, 20 times what it is on Amazon. That's what I've done, you know? And so that's why, uh, you know, a whole series of sites I sold uh, for eight figures. Um, and uh, it was my fourth exit, by the way. Um, and then uh, just to take one step further, I'm gonna share this with you. This is me kind of patting myself on the back, so you have to forgive my pride. But this is something that for me is really cool, especially since I'm, I'm fairly new in the market. And I want people to understand what it literally is possible from um, when you when you put your mind to it. And so this is a follow-up from MIT and Harvard. I don't know, can you see that? It says, today he is considered one of the greatest experts in digital marketing in the world. This was a joint publication, a, point, a joint article put out by Harvard Business Review and MIT Tech Review. And that's after a year and a half. And it's not because I'm doing things that no one else is doing. Well, it is because of that. It's because... <laughs> I think people have been focused on the fruit that's already fallen to the ground. The vast majority is still in the tree, and all you got to do is shake it a little bit. That in the fruit right falls way. In the right and way, not, exactly. It, that's a really interesting point. There. By the way, I think segmentation psychosis might be the name of the podcast. I think that <laughs> I, think, I think you just nailed that. But let's. Cool. Can you give some practical? Give give a few more like practical tips on the kind of segmentation you talked about. Someone visits your return policy. You wanna you wanna let them know about the return policy. And we're we're tying this to this whole idea of indoctrination, to the story of the brand. There's two schools of thought consistently battling, and that is that here here's where the truth is. I won't even go into what them is what they are. An inferior product with superior messaging will always beat a superior product with inferior messaging. So if you can marry a superior product with superior messaging, nobody can compete with you. What that means is here's some practical methods. Um, jump, and I'll, we'll just talk tactically. But you can now measure, you can segment your audience with the Facebook pixel on how much time they spent on your page. So the people that, the top 25% of people who spent the most time on your page, those are your buyers. Uh, time is so, dude, in this day, we get new information millions of bits on the second. And so if they spend more than a few seconds on your page, there's high interest. If they spend less than a few seconds on your page, why are you wasting money on it? You need to hit them up with your original marketing message again because they have no clue what it is. So time on page is like one of those biggest things and then you remarket them. Everyone has these tactics like, oh, I throw up a remarketing thing and I use this group of people. You know, How many of you remarket with or retarget people who Inter engaged with your uh, page on Facebook. That's one of the Facebook things. 
and and, the, and this works for a little bit, but what they don't say is why is that working and what does that really mean? So these people engaged with your page, that means that they commented, they liked it, they spent a little bit of time. So now, instead of just doubling your marketing budget, tripling your marketing budget, what specifically did they do? Take these people and figure out if they're in the same list over here and I'll combine a message that goes specific to them that gives them what they want. People. And now we're going back to basics, which is people love to buy, but you just, you need to message them correctly. Like how many people listening have ads that specifically talk about like your return policy? Like th these are things that are basic that people should know, but very few actually talk about their return policy. It's consistently sales or it's a coupon code or it's this or that. Like everyone's DPA ads are tossing up products that they looked at and they're like, okay, time is running out. Here's 15% off. If they wanted 15% off, then you know they somehow they would have got it. They would have responded to all of your emails that followed up with a yep. discount code after they they abandoned the cart. And it's so objection it's just, conquering, right? So if they're it, looking at the return is. policy, That's their objection is. isn't. It isn't yes. price that they're after. It's not price sensitivity. It's like, what if I don't like that? So they, you know that they're sensitive about that. So you message them with that message. By the way, we have this amazing return policy. So even if you don't like it, blah, blah, blah. That's makes, it. That's all it is. So all so and it, to boil it down to its most basic form, I say if I am knocking on this person's door. So when we're when we're behind a screen, we get both lazy and aggressive, and we say aggressive by saying buy my goods, buy my product, buy my product, buy my product, and that's like the only thing we do, right? And but but so we we take a step back and we say I'm knocking on your door and I'm talking to you in person. What do I say to you? That's what I say to you online. I notice that your body changes when we talk about X, Y, or Z. Well, then I talk about X, Y, or Z online. That's all it is. Like it's not rocket science, but because the web is so new, because this technology is so connective, because it's been so easy up until now, everyone's just gathering you know, the ease, all the fruit that's on the ground. And now it's time to, like we said, shake that tree correctly. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes perfect sense. I think that's a really good, uh, good metaphor, a good, good story for the people. I think, uh, I really appreciate that. And I think it, it is, it's, it's those subtle things. Like there's so many people on all, all the groups out there who'd be like, Oh, I threw up, I threw up a store and I threw up 50 bucks of ads or I threw up a hundred bucks of ads. And, and there, sometimes you, you, you get some sales, sometimes it works, but I think there's so many people that have been sort of transfixed by the ease of this business that they haven't taken the time to think ab about it holistically in in you know it, like that for example uh as a way that you just and and it's and it's subtle shifts in the way you think but it can make all the difference between someone who gets rejected and someone who, who doesn't find any success and then someone who can build something consistently over time yeah so here's here's a thought do you mind if i share this go so 2016 christmas time I don't know if you guys remember, but there was this major um, freighter, freight freight company that went out of business. It wasn't, maybe it was Maersk, I forget who it was, but like half of the world's goods are on these container ships and instead of them bringing in the port, they're literally floating them in the ocean because they know the second they bring them to a port, both countries and creditors will come and uh, seize all the goods to pay for their debt. They literally went bankrupt. And so they're, they're literally, their response was, no one go to port, just float in international waters. <laughs> I have thousands of orders that are just sitting somewhere. No one can tell me where they're at. Everyone knows this. Customers are complaining. Where is it? This is a Christmas present, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, all right, guys, we got to figure this out. No one's going to save us. These people are not going to haul their tanker into port so that our, you know, so many thousands of customers will get their goods. So I said, we've got to figure out how to air freight them in and we've got to do it immediately. So we started calling all these freight companies and they're like, sure, $45 a pound. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like the, you know, that, that that's 10 times what this stuff even costs. Yeah. Um, and so I pulled the team together and I said, we're not leaving until we figure this out. Eventually found one company that would do it for $16 a pound, but we had to commit to a million pounds of goods that year. That's a $16 million commitment, you know, for 5,000 products. Also not willing to do that. Eventually I said, we need to change our approach. Instead of trying to find someone that will do it for us, we're going to do it ourselves. So we will leave this room when we have set up a logistics company that engages in air freight better than anyone else on the planet does go. In 48 hours, we figured out how to lease the unused space on commercial airliners. 
and we brought in instead of 45 bucks a pound or even 16 bucks a pound we're paying 94 cents a pound four days from shanghai to salt lake city and it was so revolutionary that we even started shipping for amazon all of their coconut goods from thailand to florida because i could ship cheaper than literally anybody else was i had people on the ground in shanghai communicating with these airlines buying the unused space and so initially products were literally coming out through the uh, whatever that thing is, the baggage, you know, the baggage yep. thing. And we'd be out there gathering, you know, a hundred boxes. And eventually we worked it onto a system where there was actual cargo and, and we're bringing it in in trucks. My whole point is this, is that that company right there is, uh, I mean, that's my focus this year is my logistics company. You know, we've got a big footprint in China, big footprint in the U.S. And that all came out of a experience that thousands of other people were in in that same moment. Some of them said, well, let's just refund all the customers. Some said, well, quick, shut the site down and like disappear. That way we don't have to refund anybody. Um, and I'm certain that there were a few others that did the same thing that we did. That is how you go from, I think, being you know, like a marketer and, and go into actually being an entrepreneur. There's, because of Instagram, this phrase entrepreneur is like, you know, it's like the new rapper. You know, mm. like we were growing up is like, dude, are you a legit rapper? Then you're awesome. I'm like now entrepreneur, you know, I, I go on here and I change my tagline to crypto investor, altcoin evangelist, um, you know, tech entrepreneur. And it's like, what does that even mean? Well, that means that I uh, enjoy by virtue of having just typed that private jets, beautiful people, nice champagne. None of that is true. You know, like like what that truly is an entrepreneur. I mean, you look up the, de the what it actually translates to in French. It's someone who takes a problem and creates something beneficial out of it. Like yeah. so, you've got this disorganized matter, and you turn it into something organized. And I think if people would take that approach, every person, every person is able to see things very uniquely. And so if you take your unique approach and you craft it, it may not work the first year, the first 10 years, the first 20 years, but eventually you have some information or some product or something. And if you craft it well enough and you continue to hone the craft and become a master at it, just like you would spend seven years working underneath a blacksmith before you finally were able to even take the test to say, yeah, I can smash metal well enough to actually get this done, right? If you do that, sorry, I'm getting, is that... Can you see me? Because I just see two of you now. Yeah, yeah, I got you. Oh, there we go. Okay, that's so strange. All right, cool. I'm back. No worries. Okay, cool. So anyway, that's that's kind yeah. of what I'm saying is that like that, and then it, if you if you take that and you just put it in marketing and you communicate with your customers how you would communicate with someone with your unique language patterns, your unique emotional responses, you'll increase your efficacy dramatically. Very, very cool. So let's talk about one of the things I wanted to talk about was your actual store because a lot of people who do e-commerce, they, they don't talk a lot about the, their domain or their store or their approach. They can talk about their, their general strategy, but you, I saw that you did a post the other day actually on, on social media where you actually talked about your store and went into it. And I think the approach that you've take, taken is really interesting and I wanted to just talk about it a little bit. So so your, your, I don't know if it's your main store, but the one store you, you mentioned here was LDS Man, which is which is a Mormon site, right? Like it's a, it's it a, was, it started. It was, yeah. that's how it started. So talk a little bit about that because to me, it's, it's a really interesting approach. I, I talk a lot about passion niches and people going in to passion niches uh, with a, with sort of a niche idea of a store. This is a different kind of thing because this is like, it's a general store, a gadget store essentially is from what I understand. And, but it's 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 a like a faith niche in a way. So it's actually unrelated to the product. But you but but talk about how you built that and, and how you built the story around it. Yeah. So I'm in Utah, and I realized that there's unique language systems. There's unique messaging. And I said, so I'm going to create something that caters to this group. And so initially, the first day I Got threw money. up. Yeah, they have a lot of money. Exactly. Um, and so, uh, I mean, that, that was the basis for this. So I was using products that other people were using, but I was throwing here. Here's an example I like to use to explain this. Um, behind my house is like world-class downhill mountain biking. And one of the problems that mountain bikers have is if they're going down the trail slowly, they're always, there's just this frightened nerve that says someone is bombing down the hill and they're gonna kill me when they run into me. And so you spend all your time looking back real quick, but because it curves so much, you do that at the risk of running into stuff. Do you remember as we were growing up, they had those spy sunglasses and you could look to the left and see directly behind you? Yep. All Not you there. do is you take those and you simply say, 
these are downhill mountain biking safety glasses or jamming glasses or whatever you want to call them make it really sexy so that while you're looking forward you can see who's behind you prime example like it's an unrelated product the product is actually built for some other demographic like spies right yeah but you take it and you turn it into a product that fulfills the need for this group of people who gain their identity from their hobby See, there's a difference when yep. you say, hey, check it out. Here's this mop. Like I had a, a buddy. Well, I won't go into that. But here's a mop or here's some kitchen gadget or here's this or that. That's great. And you'll sell to grandmas here and there. But you won't create anything that has enterprise value. Enterprise value is something that someone else will acquire from you at a multiple. And that occurs only with a few unique things. Do you have IP? Do you have defensible products? Most people pulling products in from China, there's no IP. And there's no defensible product. So up until now, the thought has been, well, there, there's no way to build something with enterprise value. And that's simply not the case because we proved them wrong. Um, and so what you do is you, you take these products and you create a defensible product with other products with by reinforcing products. their identity. Exactly. See, people, you can buy eyeballs, like video views. You can buy likes. There's only one thing on Facebook that they can't sell you. They physically can't, and that is shares. They can't sell shares. They'll say engagement, right? But that still is this thing like, oh, well, they watched your video for more than three seconds. So that counts as some sort of metric of engagement. It's like this. Shares, they can't sell because sharing is the only way that you reinforce truly who you are. When you share something, it increases the perception of you that you want others to have about you. And so... If you craft products and messages and ads in such a way that it will build the person's identity that they want others to perceive them with, then you've built something with enterprise value. You've built a product that will sell. You've mm -hmm. built something that is acquirable. And that's what we did with LDS Man. Now, you know, since the first article came out, like the pixel was put on dozens of sites. I got all kinds of like Pakistani traffic and Indian traffic and the site basically went downhill. And so while it still exists today, it's like, you know, it's like the Colosseum today. There's no battles raging inside of it, right? But the, the skeleton is still up. We simply, once I realized that was happening, we simply transitioned to other sites um, and continued to move forward with them, but under the cover of, of anonymity as opposed to this, this public site right here. You can do this with any group. So, um, I mean, you nailed it on the head, us using a passion group, you know, a passion niche, but using generic products just pitched perfectly for that niche. Did I, did I answer your question or I, I forget I what think your so. question was? No, I, I think, I think it, it did for sure, but it's, it's a, it's a passion. Yeah. It's not a, it's not a traditional passion niche. It's a, it's a passionate group, but you're, but you're still, so, so you're, and so part of the story is that, that they would want to support a company that was calling out to them essentially, because it's sort of a, it's an insular in group, the right? Like they would, in they the would beginning. Prefer, yeah. So it was really easy to feed the pixel data because I could, um, target incredibly uh, narrowly, right? Yeah. So I knew exactly who I was messaging. I knew the language I needed to use. I knew what they were and were not interested in. I knew what and would not get them to share. See, my whole thing is this. People are freaked out with the cost of ads. That's a problem if you have no strategy based on organic sales on Facebook. So my metric is for every million views this is a, of a video, I need to have two and a half thousand shares. That's like my bare minimum. If I don't have two and a half thousand shares per, per million views, then the Facebook ad cost is gonna kill me. I'm speaking generically with you know average prices. If I do have two and a half thousand or more shares, I can force that baby viral by dumping more money on it. And those two and a half thousand shares will, will turn into a hundred thousand organic views. And that hundred thousand will offset the million paid, the 900,000 paid views that then make it a profitable uh, engine. And so if your focus is my product is so boring, it sucks so bad, the messaging is so poor that I have to only focus on spending so much money with Facebook so that they'll put it in front of the right people eventually, then yeah, you're gonna fail. And that, I mean, it's a great time right now because all these marketers who are bringing in so much noise, they're just making the marketing so noisy, Facebook's weeding them all out by, by raising the price. Go for it. Because the people that actually understand what needs to happen, there's all kinds of space. And as long as you approach it saying, okay, I, you know, all I'm trying to do is pour money onto an already viral opportunity, 
to push it even more viral. Like that, that's all it is. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah, that makes perfect sense. That, so what are, what are some tactics to, so, you know, to actually write ads in a way that gets people to show? I think it's a brilliant idea because those, those impressions, those 100,000 impressions are going to be worth exponentially more than the ones that you paid for in, in a way, right? Because they're being shared. It's like influencer marketing. You're, you're getting is. access to their, to their audience, their most trusted audience, and their value signaling with you, with your products. So like that, that, that's smart. What are, are there any tactics that you actually have when it comes to like writing copy or using imagery that really makes, is it, is it, is it a, is it about the ad copy? I know, I know, you know, creative is, is the, is the biggest factor oftentimes in, in these kinds of things. What are some things that go into a creative that's shareable? The first three seconds, like the first three seconds are the only thing that matters, um, until you get to the bottom of the iceberg. Right. So you've got the tip and you've got everything down. Then you've got the very bottom. So I'll talk about the very bottom afterwards. But the vast majority is that first three seconds. So um, I'll just talk about what these other publications have written about. And uh, so I have and it's probably still out there on the Internet. We created like 50 different beginnings for a video. Um, The rest of the video is the same. Because I understood that for the rest of the video, there's a few things I need to touch on. I need to touch on how quickly it's going to ship. I need to touch on how, how cool they're going to be with it, how much fun they're going to have with it, show them the kind of summer they could have, just like the beer commercials, right? As long as you drink this, there's going to be chicks in bikinis on the beach with you, right? But they'll never get to that point if the first three seconds don't capture their attention in a world with attention where everyone has hyperactive attention deficit disorder. In that world, those first three seconds matter. And there's this somewhat random factor. What I thought was going to catch didn't catch. So we made like 50 different variations of those first three seconds. And when I found the one that worked, I'm in the process of doing that right now with the new product as well. That's defensible. So we have a patent and everything like that. But I understand that just because we have that and I know it's a a good product doesn't mean we'll hit the growth unless those first three seconds matter. And so during those first three seconds, that's where you share that thing that people are like, oh, dude, that's yeah. that. And so whatever the product is, that's what it has to do. And then they have to, in their minds, be like, when things get complex, this is what I do. I, and this is related, I promise. I go back 50,000 years ago. So there's this complex social hierarchy. Why do people share what they do and all this stuff? And I say, okay, let me simplify that. I'm going to go back 50,000 years ago. We are tribal. We're living in small groups. If I get kicked out of this tribe, I surely am doomed. You know, the skeletons that we find are dudes that are running around solo in the glaciers, right? Because they weren't allowed in the in the tribal lands because they were kicked out. So all they could do is wander by themselves. Wandering by yourself is certain death. You can't propagate the species, etc. So most of our fears come from, ah, are they? what are they going to think of me? Am I going to kick down? And that means that on the other side, there that's the negative. That means there's a sufficiently positive side where we have actions that are encouraged by saying, ha-ha, adhesion. They're going to want me to be a part of this longer. This will make up for some of my mistakes if I do X, Y, or Z, right? So if you bring in a pig or a deer that you killed, great. That feeds this side. If you go on 10 hunts and you don't bring anything and you eat meat, that's on this side. So how do we focus on this aspect, which is social adhesion? It's like social goodwill to your group. So you do this with products. You say, how can I influence them so that in their their primitive brain, that brain that is worried about survival, literally death or life, those two things, right? Yeah. And so, so you're trying to get them, you're trying to show something in those first like three seconds. That really matter. Oh, sorry. You paused out there for a sec. Oh, go ahead. I think that we froze for a sec. We did. We're good. Okay. Okay. So, so yeah, so those first three seconds, you're focused on that aspect right there, the goodwill or terror of this section of it, where it's like, they're going to kick me out of the tribe. Right. And that, that's where you come in and you know you've succeeded when you get massive shares. Because then people are saying, ha-ha, check it out. You want me in your tribe. Check out what I'm sharing. This is me. This is yeah. me. Share, 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 share. I'm and an entrepreneur. Ex- exactly. <laughs> whatever, right? Yeah. Exactly. And that's yeah. precisely the entire everything can be summed up in that one concept. So if you found some video that someone else is sharing and they have a million shares in it, th- this is why I was never a fan of – Share it in Bangladesh and get a million views and then push it out because, okay, so you'll get a few weak minds that are like, well, a million Bangladeshis like this, I might as well like that. But that doesn't 
that doesn't fit that aspect of it. And so there's going to be some people like, this is not popular. I don't like this because that means I'm going to have to work harder. Aha. Welcome to the world, right? That this is the world and the days of, you know, I was talking, uh, I listened to Drew Canoli talk about in the very beginning, all he had to do was push a boost, the boost button, and it would be shown to like 10 million people. And it didn't matter how good his video was because out of that 10 million, there were going to be 500 that were so bored in that moment that life sucked so bad that it didn't matter how ridiculous the content was, they would watch. And out of them, 10 people would buy. But see, those days are gone. We don't have that luxury. So you have to think like this, otherwise the people that do will decimate you. Amazing. So we're coming up on that. This has uh, been a ton of value in this podcast. I, I feel like you're, you're gonna have to become a Jason Silva to my Joe Rogan. I, <laughs> I need to have you on like several times so we could just continue to mine lots cool. of different things. But I just wanted to ask you quickly about your podcast because, you know, I've been podcasting now for just under a year and I'm really enjoying it. It's like one of my favorite parts of what I do. And and it's we're getting a good following. We're getting lots of views, but we're not we haven't taken off. We haven't we haven't approached the level of virality that, for instance, your, your show, the, the Trevor Chapman show has. Talk a little bit about the evolution of that podcast and what you credit its sort of like meteoric rise with. Sure. I took two weeks. So first off, I said, I'm going to do this podcast. And I answered the hard questions before I did it, so I wouldn't have to, them, have to answer them afterwards. Will I monetize it? I sat there and I went back and forth for a little while. And then I listened to podcasts and I listened halfway through where all of a sudden they're like, oh, Eric, uh, stop, stop, stop everything. Do you love landing pages, mm. right? And, and I was just like, suck, I'm not gonna do that. So I said, one, I'm not gonna monetize it. And I answered all these hard questions in advance. You don't have to go through all that because of the time. So then number two, as I said, I've got the map out. I know why I'm doing it. I'm doing it as a solo passion project. I'm doing it for me. These people, I would have to pay $50,000 to, to sit down and say, hey, look, I want an hour of your time and I'm gonna pick your brain about everything I want and you're gonna answer me honestly. 50 grand. And I was like, well, the whole reason I'm doing this is I'm gonna say, hey, you get access to my audience, blah, 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 and I get you for free. That's the whole purpose, dude. And so I said, oh, I, yeah, I know why I'm doing it. <laughs> so I'm like, I know why I'm doing it. And if I scratch my own itch, birds of a feather, they'll be interested as well. So now I don't want to wait for 200 million downloads to beat Tim Ferriss. So what do I do? So that's when I stepped back and I just gathered all the data I could over two weeks. And I saw which podcasts were dominating. How often did they publish? What did they talk about? What was the entire scope of the messaging? Not just when someone finally says, download that podcast. That's the end. That's summiting Everest after a year of preparation, after six, week of, six weeks of trekking in. Like there's so much that happens before, bam, you stand on the summit of Everest. And I said, that's what I need to understand all of that. And so I, I wrote down all these identifiers. And then um, this is where we could go in really deep in the tangent field. And I won't talk about it right now, but I have Excellent. to at least so that you understand. Yeah. Okay. When I want a result, this is what I do. I create a mathematical formula. Here is my result, equals sign. And then the mathematical formula. There are variables that influence it a little bit, plus they, they add or subtract. There are variables that hyperdrive it. Those are multi, like that's multiplied by whatever, right? Uh, and then there's things that absolutely destroy it, and that's divided by. So I said anything that is divided by, okay, get that out first off so that I don't, I'm not losing ground. Now, what are the multiplying variables? Those things that are worth more than what they actually are because simply it's built into the formula. Now, if I understand this formula properly, then I'm going to be able to influence the result. And for like the first 10 days, I didn't. Like it didn't. And then all of a sudden, and I was trying different things. All of a sudden, one day I have this message pop up. And it's this dude in this mastermind group I'm in. He's like, congrats, Trevor, number six overall. And I'm like, what? So I look at it and I'm like, number six, yes! Because I had been trying these different things and I found a messaging mechanism that uh, works. And so I tried everything, billboards. I even tried billboards like in Australia on the other side of the planet, um, all kinds of advertising, all this stuff. And I found that one, like I found for me this equation that, that I understood. The problem with podcasts is that you've got a small group of people. And so um, there was a few things, including my intro. If you listen to like my early intro, it was crazy, dude. Like, and it turned a lot of people off, but it turned a lot of people on. And so when, I needed that original inertia to get going. And then I changed- Your core Yeah, tribe. my tribe, yep. 
And then I needed to change that to make it more palatable to everyone. Like it wasn't initially called the Trevor Chapman show either. People think that this is a mistake. Also, I'm like, oh, freak, this all sucks. I'm going to change it to the Trevor Chapman show. I'm going to tone down my intro. This was all, this was an evolution of, I needed to gather that core group that was going to really uh, pr uh, propagate it. It was called from seven to eight figures. So I was getting people that were very niche, very narrow, kind of like the LDS man stuff, right? Yep. And now that, now that we have all this, now I can focus on taking it to that next level. So in broad terms, without any real specific tactics, because it would take a lot longer than five minutes, um, that's kind of what I did. Very cool. So now in these last five minutes, I just, this is a little left field, but I think everyone who's in this space, like I say, they're, they're self-improvers. They're people who love ideas. I think there's a lot of people in our space who love ideas, who love body hacking and mind hacking. I wanted to know from you, like who right now, what, what sort of external thinker? in your life that is lighting your fire the most, like either, whether it's spiritually or through body hacking or like what, what which ideas are, are lighting your fire and who are they from right now? Yeah, so I'm liking a lot of what our, Aubrey Marcus has to say. Mm -hmm. uh, fascinating guy. Some of those that are always there, Alan Watts has really interesting things and I really enjoy listening to him. Um, you know, I read every single day and if I don't, it kind of messes, you know, it messes with my day because I need- when do you read? Uh, I wish I had an exact scheduled time, but I read no, whenever like, I can. Yeah, like, you just pick here, up. Here it is. I just grab okay. it and I keep that I'm constantly reading. So if I feel, can you hear me? It says yep. it just yeah. a few things. Okay. It cut out so for a second, but we're good. If I have a second, then I'll pull it out and I can read something that I feel like reading in the minute. So I'll have three or four things at the same, you know, books open at the same time. Um, and then you've got your standard people, you know, like Tim Ferriss. Oh, there's this dude that's really fascinating, Serge, and I forget what his last name is, but he uh, uh, he's a, a like a Russian guy. He sold his company for half a million, half a billion dollars, and he's focused on like living to be like a thousand years old. That dude's fascinating. Uh -huh. um, I just invested in this uh, new company that came from MIT, um, and a, a lot of the founders I'm following their stuff. They have already with a human brain, a pig brain, and a chicken brain, you die in their facility. So it's a little gray right now because that's illegal, you know, assisted suicide. But then they they uh, keep your brain alive for 50 years. And they believe that over the next 50 years, enough technology will come out where they can restore your consciousness either into a body or into a machine or something like that. So cool. all of it, like where, where science belief systems and technology, the 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 confluence of all of that, that's fascinating. So anyone in that space, I listen to. Serge Faguet or Fag that's the guy. That's the guy. Yeah, yeah. F A G U E T. I don't want to pronounce it too uh, carelessly there, but uh, yeah, it sounds like he sounds like a really interesting dude. I'm totally gonna check that out. He's got uh, some good articles. He was on Kevin Rose's <laughs> podcast, and so, dude. The other thing is this, and let me just say this and end. Whenever someone that is further ahead of me gives me a piece of advice, I almost always adopt it. Kevin Rose reached out to me and he said, hey dude, your show has a lot of potential. The problem is, is that it's called from seven to eight figures. You need to change it to the Trevor Chapman show. And within an hour, everything was changed. The domain was changed. The name of the show was changed because I said to myself, I want guys like Kevin Rose listening to my podcast. That's who I want. And so I'm going to immediately adopt, even if I don't understand it fully, these people are further ahead of, than me in these areas. And so I will do this. Now I, you know, I beat Kevin Rose in terms of downloads and listens, et cetera, but he beats me in terms of his circle and his influence. And so immediately I took that advice. I think too often we hang on to these morsels of self-valued importance and you can have your number one podcast with you as the number one listener all you want. I'm speaking not to you, Eric, but in general yeah. to anyone. But if you want, I wanted guys like Kevin Rose to listen to it. So I immediately adopted their advice as if scientific truth. And that's, that's kind of one of those things that I do. That's interesting. That's a great piece of advice to end it on. And I, I swear this is, this will be a, a series. Uh, this will be, be be part one, but I want to thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. If people want to get in touch with you, they want to pick your brain about things. Uh, should they try to add you on Facebook or what do you what do you yeah, recommend? Yeah, Facebook, Instagram. Um, it's either at J Trevor Chapman or 
the Trevor Chapman, one of the two. Um, usually they can't nice. find me because there's a J in the beginning. So J Trevor Chapman. Cool. Nice, man. Well, thanks again for coming on. Lots of great actionable items here and uh, look forward to doing it again soon. Absolutely, Eric. Thank you, brother. Okay, cheers. All right, and we're out, man. That was that was awesome. There's a lot of a lot of kinetic energy in that. Cool, man. I'm happy. Happy, happy. I loved it. Okay, cool. Well, uh, let's stay in touch, and I'll let you know when it let's comes out. And uh, yeah, Thanks, cool, brother. Man. All right, man. Chat soon.